Um, so, uh, I'm the speaker uh, this evening, and I'm going to speak on the subject, Is God Cruel? Basically on the subject of, of God and evil. In this fairly brief talk on a very big subject, I would like to sketch out some ways of thinking about the problem of God and suffering. I emphasize that all I will do is give you a sketch and that I won't consider many important considerations that I would like to include. We'll have time for discussion later, so my aim is to provide some springboards for discussion and for further reflection. In speaking on the subject of God and suffering, I am walking a knife edge, and I realize that different people will respond very differently depending on their personal experiences. I cannot do justice to the range of personal experiences out there, but I would like to acknowledge from the outset that there is this diversity, and that in what I will say in this talk, I am endeavoring to do as much justice as I possibly can to what people have experienced and are going through. My apologies in advance if I fail in this. On a more personal note, a personal aim if you like, I wish to stand up for the voice that raises hard questions about God and suffering, asking questions like, is God cruel? Is God indifferent? Does God care about me? Who refuses to accept easy or neat answers. There can be a subtle form of censorship here, where the suffering person is gently and well-intentionedly silenced because we are uncomfortable with their pain and their hard questions, which we do by coming out with easy sayings that try to cloak the scandal, that evade the sting of the question of what suffering is all about, and how we can possibly reconcile a loving and all-powerful God with the way the world is and what people have to endure. But there can be another form of censorship here too, a kind of censorship that some experience very keenly but others do not. I'm talking about what is effectively a kind of self-censorship, but the struggling believer feels that asking such questions betrays a lack of trust in God, a lack of openness to God's love, a lack of faith. And to ask such questions then seems to speak of spiritual and moral failure, but the questions simply won't go away, but continue to niggle, even if not properly acknowledged. Now it's far from obvious to me that to ask the hard questions about God and suffering indicates spiritual failing. We should remember that hard questions are asked in the scriptures, most famously perhaps in the book of Job, but also in the Psalms and in the prophets and elsewhere too. We have the great outcry of the prophet Jeremiah, why does the way of the guilty prosper? Why do all who are treacherous survive? Lines that inspired one of the great religious poems of the English language written by the anguished Jesuit poet Jeremy Hopkins in one of his later sonnets. Thou art indeed just, Lord, if I contend with thee. But, sir, so what I plead is just. Why do sinners' ways prosper, and why must disappointment all I endeavour end? But why should we be surprised that the scriptures raise such questions in the first place. After all, religious people believe that we are called to love our neighbour and our world. The fact that we ask hard questions can be understood as a sign that we care about our world and its suffering, that we are not detached from it. If we were completely insensitive and unconcerned about our neighbour, our world and our own well-being, then the question about God and suffering would probably not even arise. In my limited experience, suffering is more likely to damage religious faith when it is not given space to be acknowledged and accepted, 
where the basic existential questions, the big why questions, are seen as opposed to faith, or as weakness of faith, or as something to be downplayed or even embarrassed by, rather than viewed as possibly legitimate, understandable, and <coughs> even healthy within the life of faith. A standard example that is given when it comes to speaking about God and suffering is from the life of C.S. Lewis. The story is not very accurately recounted in the film on the life of Lewis entitled Shadowlands, a film that I sometimes show people coming to Oxford for the first time. If you want to see Oxford at its very, very best, just go and watch Shadowlands. It looks very beautiful there. C.S. Lewis thought a great deal about the problem of God and suffering, and in 1940 published a book entitled The Problem of Pain. I don't think it's wholly unfair to say that on the basis of this book and the lectures he gave on the problem of pain and suffering and God, that Lewis became known as a sort of expert on the issue. If you wanted an answer to the problem of God and suffering, C.S. Lewis was your man. The Problem of Pain is a fascinating book with many different aspects, but much of it presents a certain kind of response to the issue of God and suffering, presenting arguments that try to make some sense of it all. Let me come clean. I do think that there is some value in this kind of argument, and I do think that they can be of help. But I also think that it's important to acknowledge their limitations as well. Before I reflect on this particular matter, let me give you some examples of the sorts of arguments I'm thinking about here, but without focusing on C.S. Lewis in particular. So I will depart a bit from C.S. <coughs> Lewis. We can speak of <clears throat> suffering due to moral evil and natural evil. Moral evil can be understood as involving the exercise of intelligence and will, decisions taken and choices made in order to bring about what is bad in some way. We see much moral evil about us, alas. Various forms of abuse, violent crimes, drugs and antisocial behaviour, betrayal by those whom we loved or perhaps even loved. And then there are those extreme cases of moral evil, genocide, terrorism, sadistic and gratuitous acts of torture, the gulags, the killing fields, Auschwitz, and the list goes on. There are many responses to the problem of how to reconcile a loving and all-powerful God with moral evil, and most of them bring in the issue of God respecting our freedom, that God does not treat us like puppets, and so part of this is that God allows us to do bad things, and that God allows us also to engage in moral struggle so that we might cultivate strength of character and virtue, where we face up to parts of ourselves that are destructive and hopefully overcome them. If God created us as innately lovely and nice, then although certain goods would result from this, other goods would be excluded or lessened. Furthermore, if God made us a good deal nicer and lovelier than we are, it wouldn't be you or me who would be created, but others, not defined by our sinfulness, our moral failings, but because of our histories, they are a part of who we are right now. I would not exist as I am now if God did not permit moral evil, but then neither would you. Now the value of any person is not amenable to being slotted into a calculus of debits and credits. There is something unique and incommensurable about every person. But to be fair, we might still want to ask the question, couldn't God have made us just that bit nicer? <laughs> I would still be me, but a nicer version of John than the one you're stuck with. But then, 
maybe we could still ask the same question if we were that little bit nicer. Maybe, maybe not. I'll finish my brief reflection on moral evil at this point with some words of Simone Weil from her essay, Some Reflections on the Love of God. <coughs> this is what she says, extraordinary writer. It was by an inconceivable love <coughs> that God created beings so distant from himself. It was by an inconceivable love that he comes down so far as to reach them. It is by an inconceivable love that they then ascend so far as to reach him. It is the same love. The more mediocre I am, the more obvious is the immensity of the love which maintains me in existence. The evil which we see everywhere in the world is the form of affliction and crime, in the form of affliction and crime, is a sign of the distance between us and God. But this distance is love, and therefore it should be loved. This does not mean loving evil, but loving God through the evil. Very interesting, very provocative position. Then we have, of course, natural evil. Natural evil is the evil that comes from the way the universe is, because of natural laws such as gravity, and the way the universe has been set up. A recent, a fairly recent example of natural evil that came to mind when writing this talk was the tsunami that occurred on Christmas Day 2004, maybe more poignant for taking place on Christmas Day. Several hundred thousand lives were extinguished. The human suffering was inexpressible, and the landscape was laid waste. The causes of this calamity were natural. The movement of tectonic plates, there was no ill will on the part of the tectonic plates or on the part of the water that drowned the people, carrying them off to their deaths. And philosophers provide all sorts of scenarios here, but they generally boil down, as perhaps with the case of moral evil, to God respecting a certain autonomy in the universe, or perhaps better, better put, a certain integrity to the universe. Put simply, if God intervened every time something natural was going to lead to suffering, then yes, things would be better in certain respects, but worse in others. Boulders rolling down the hill to crush the lovely, innocent and unsuspecting person at the bottom of the hill would suddenly stop or change course, or the innocent, lovely and unsuspecting person <coughs> would be lifted by the hand of God into the air, out of danger, or God would give this sad, lovely, and innocent, and unsuspecting person a quick whisper in the ear, or a nudge. But then it could be argued that if God were always to intervene like that, then the price would be the breakdown in the causal order, the order of cause and effect, and in the longer term, that would be too high a price to pay. If you add to this that the way God has established the universe is such that human life is possible, that if God, say, altered what we call Planck's constant by the slightest, slightest amount, the universe would not be one where you and I could survive. The universe seems to be very finely tuned, so God clearly knows what he is doing. But on the other hand, you could reply by saying, why let God off the hook? Could he still have created things that where natural evil was still present, but where things were not so bad, that suffering would not be so great as it is in this world? It is, I think, a good question, a fair question, and many people ask it. <clears throat> but perhaps there are subtle but important trade-offs here. For example, phys physical pain can be terribly destructive, but it can also be a mechanism to help ensure that we look after ourselves, that we keep away from danger. There are many other such considerations to reflect upon. It is not a straightforward matter, regardless of what side of the fence you happen to be sitting on, or be on, I should say, you don't sit on fences. Now back to C.S. Lewis again. <coughs> I mentioned that in 1940, 
he published a book, The Problem of Pain. It's worth keeping in mind that in 1940, the Blitz, there was a threatened invasion. So, but in 1960, he published another book that addresses the problem of God and suffering, entitled A Grief Observed. The Lewis who wrote The Problem of Pain had experienced much suffering. He'd been in the trenches in the Great War. His mother died when he was nine. He endured the onslaught of a sadistic headmaster. But at this time, in 1960s, in A Grief Observed, his own personal sufferings are center stage. The book is not so much a response to suffering in general as an expression of and reflection on a particular suffering, Lewis's own grief at the death of his wife, Joy Gresham. It is a very different book to The Problem of Pain. The Problem of Pain is a very well constructed but book in, written in well organized paragraphs and chapters. It largely presents the kind of intellectual arguments I've just discussed. And it's not, I think, completely unfair to say to, about Lewis that he sometimes gives the impression that the question of God and suffering is now largely resolved. <clears throat> but let's now look at a grief observed. The title strikes me as usual, unusual, given the nature of the book, because although it is about grief, it's not really about grief observed, but rather grief experienced. It's not about grief from the standpoint of the observer, the third personal perspective, but about grief from the first personal perspective. My grief, my pain. Instead of beautifully structured paragraphs and arguments, here we have, I think, a fractured text, basically a collection of <coughs> times almost standalone paragraphs. I've come across this before, I'm thinking of a particular work, a work by William Hazlitt called Lieber Moores, a kind of work that's very raw. And it, because it's so raw and immediate, the author has not had the time to process it and to, as it were, try to change it. What you see, what you experience when you read the book is almost the raw pain itself. Now here are two related passages from A Grief Observed. And when he refers to H in the text, H stands for his wife, Joy, Joy Gresham. What chokes every prayer and every hope is the memory of all the prayers H and I offered and all the fo false hopes we had. Not hopes raised merely by our own wishful thinking, hopes encouraged, even forced upon us by false diagnoses, by x-ray photographs, by strange remissions, by one temporary recovery that might have ranked as a miracle. Step by step, we were led up the garden path. Time after time, when he seemed, when God seemed most gracious, he was really preparing the next torture. Here's another passage from A Grief Observed. Not that I am, I think, in much danger of ceasing to believe in God. The real danger is coming to believe such dreadful things about him. The conclusion I dread is not, so there's no God at all, but, so this is what God's really like. Deceive yourself no longer. Now contrast those two passages from The Grief Observed with what is perhaps the best known passage from his earlier book, from the 1940, uh, The Problem of Pain. This is what he says. We can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Now, <clears throat> there are many things going on in the shift in Lewis's writing, but I'd like to draw your attention to two of them. 
First of all, there is a very big difference between thinking of the problem of God and suffering from the third personal standpoint and from the first personal standpoint. From the third personal standpoint, we can raise big existential questions in the abstract, but at a safe distance. Responses that may possess credibility from the third personal perspective might strike someone from the first personal perspective who is undergoing great suffering as simply missing the point or as inappropriate or perhaps even offensive. I think that any response to the problem of God and suffering that does not acknowledge the sufferer's own account is surely incomplete at best. For many people, there is something chillingly third personal, even impersonal, in describing the suffering of the world as God's megaphone, God's instrument to force us to be better people. Another feature of some of the arguments put forward <coughs> is that they all too often they can rely upon what can seem like a system of debits and credits. That if the credits are greater than the debits, then God is off the hook and everything makes complete and utter sense. In one sense, Christians do believe something of this in the sense that, a very important qualification, as shown in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <coughs> An innocent man who was tortured and killed, but who was raised from death, thereby revealing that the love and power of God is greater than sin and death, that love and goodness and joy will have the last word. And this is surely at the very centre of any Christian account of God and suffering. But even so, many Christians would say that however we are to understand this, it would be a mistake about the, to think about the passion, death and resurrection of Christ in terms of debits and credits as part of a great giant cosmic calculation. According to the great giant cosmic calculation, in this life I may have to endure much such and such a number of units of suffering. But after my death, I will hopefully enjoy bliss with God, who is infinite. And infinity is a lot, lot, lot bigger than the number of units of suffering endured. So the problem of God and suffering is thereby in one dull stroke neatly solved. The problem, however, with thinking about the passion, death, and resurrection, and Christian hope, in these terms, is that it all too easily slips into negating or even bypassing the reality of grief and of suffering, that it all too easily looks upon the gulags and the extermination camps as something analogous to the prick of a needle that is well worth enduring in order to have the benefits of the medicine. To quote Ron Williams, speaking about the tsunami of 2004, if some religious genius came up with an explanation of exactly why all these deaths made sense, would we feel happier or safer or more confident in God? Wouldn't we feel something of a chill at the prospect of a God who deliberately plans a program that involves a certain level of casualty? In the end of the day, though, the Christian reflecting on God and suffering must go back to the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that God has in Jesus Christ endured great suffering for us, that God's grace is not cheap. But, very important but, that God does not let suffering have the last word. Moreover, the Christian and the non-Christian can acknowledge that whilst pain and suffering can sometimes be tremendously destructive and profoundly negative. And we have to be careful what we say here. Strange though it may seem, suffering can sometimes, <coughs> sometimes, but not always, be a place of growth. I do not want to smuggle in the sort of calculation I've just expressed on ease about, as if the positive aspects of suffering somehow outweigh the negative and so it's all fine. My point, rather, is that when we go back to the first personal accounts, 
people speaking about their own suffering, we sometimes find that there is more going on than we might at first think. Again, sometimes suffering seems to be straightforwardly and profoundly destructive. We can find nothing positive coming from it. But sometimes we do find accounts where men and women find value and growth in their suffering. It is a complex matter. And one does need, again, to be very careful how one speaks about that. We need to be careful about what we say here. And it must never be a case of the pro-God people putting words into the mouths of suffering people and then anti-God people putting other words into the mouths of suffering people. We must let those who have suffered and who suffer speak for themselves. In this talk, I have perhaps given you a hodgepodge of maybe semi-baked ideas, maybe incompletely expressed and explored ideas. I've not said anything on many other highly relevant issues, such as the nature of evil and the relationship of suffering and love. I think that's an important, point, important issue. My main concerns are with presenting you with some ideas to get your juices going, but also to say to you that to ask hard questions about God and suffering is right and proper, certainly nothing to be ashamed of. I have not given some definite conclusion or argument to answer all your concerns, and I'm not sure that I would be comfortable in trying to do so. As I said earlier, in my limited experience, suffering is more likely to damage religious faith when it is not given space to be acknowledged and accepted, where the basic existential questions, the big why questions, are seen as opposed to faith or as weakness of faith, or as something to be downplayed or even embarrassed about, rather than viewed as very often legitimate, understandable, and even healthy within the life of faith. But coming near to the end of this talk, let me tell you a story that might illustrate one way of thinking about the problem. A story recounted by the Auschwitz survivor, Eli Wiesel. In Auschwitz, a group of rabbis, all devout men, decided to put God on trial. God would be called as a defendant, if you like. God would be put in the dock. The trial lasted several nights. Witnesses recalled, evidence presented, and con conclusions arrived at. The conclusion was that God was found guilty of crimes against humanity, crimes against his people. <coughs> and there was a long silence. And then, after a while, one of the rabbis broke the silence by saying, it's now time for evening prayers. So they started praying. These devout men who prosecuted God offered prayers to God. Here's what Herbert McCabe, in his essay on evil, has to say. Even though he does not prosecute God, I think his position is very close, not very different at all. This is what he says in his wonderful, inimitable style. At the end of this hearing, I hope you will agree that God has not been proved guilty. But I expect that you will be as puzzled as I am about his innocence. <laughs> in other words, I hope it will remain a mystery to you why God has done what he has done, but you will at least agree that what he has done does not prove his guilt. And I must say, as somebody who lived with Herbert McKay, when I, when I read his words, I always have his voice, his very, his timbre of his voice, and his intonation in my head. Here's another way of thinking about it. We ought to be honest about God and admit that we do not have all the answers. But we should also be honest with God. We can ask God tough questions, and we can say tough things to God. We can tell God what we really think. After all, God knows our hearts and our souls. That's what religious people believe. And we can put all this to him in plain and unvarnished language. 
But after we've said our piece, we can perhaps stop and listen to what God might want to say in reply. God's ways are inscrutable and no one has the full picture. There is a certain mystery here. And maybe in the strange way of mysteries, it can still make sense. Maybe it does to you. Maybe, however, it doesn't make sense to you, and I, for one, can understand that as well. But even if it does make, even if it does make sense, perhaps it ought to make an uneasy sense at best, a sense that does not let the questions go away, a sense that where if the questions have gone away, then one does not really understand what the questions are all about. Thank you very much for listening.